This week's Cloudcast is brought to you by Momentum SI. Whether you want to migrate applications to the cloud, transform to enable DevOps, gain insight from big data, or accelerate your agile development, Momentum SI's strategy, consulting, and hands-on expertise can help you get there faster and with greater success. Check them out at MomentumSI.com. And now, on to the show. Cloudcast Media presents, from the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina, this is the Cloudcast with Aaron Dell and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome back to another episode of the Cloudcast. Aaron and I are finally back. Uh, tons and tons of weeks of travel on the road. So, Aaron, good to finally be back on the show with you again. Yeah, exactly. It's been a while. We, we tried. We were so regular for a while, and then all of a sudden it just went to crap. So here we are. We're, we're like, back. We're like old people. We were regular for a while, and now we've gone to crap. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So uh, so before we introduce our guest, um, should we should we recap our, our sort of uh, – annual state of the podcast launch that we do that we sort of uh, do some deep thinking and, and some of the changes we plan for the show. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we take all of the money and profits that we have and, and we buy ourselves lunch. Um, <laughs> and then we sit around and shoot the shit and figure out what we want to do for the next year or so. Right. And uh, it's always been kind of last couple of years has been like, Hey, we, we see this thing coming, we see this thing coming. And, and now we, th- we think we're going to pivot a little bit, which might come as some news to some folks. You want to tell everyone about it? Yeah. So, you know, I think, um, you know, we, we've, we've enjoyed doing the cloud stuff for a while. I think, um, we've sort of come to the realization that, that the value of the show is, is not in kind of talking about what's going on today, but sort of talking about what's, what's evolving. So, uh, we kind of feel like the the mainstream cloud stuff, whether it's OpenStack and CloudStack and and private cloud and all those sort of things, is pretty mainstream. We're not we're not adding value, as they say. So we're we're going to kind of shift the show a little bit. Uh, we're not going to change the name of it or anything or the the format. Uh, what we're going to try and focus much more on, you know, how how things are evolving uh, into public cloud, um, how people are people are evolving sort of their skill set, their businesses around. Software, whether it's software defined stuff or developing applications or DevOps, and um, so the show's going to shift a little bit here. Uh, we may have some some clunky ones for a little while as we we sort of find a new little bit of a new audience, some new guests, and so forth. But uh, we'll we'll try and we'll try and keep it interesting, and we'll try and keep it you know a year or so ahead of kind of where we think things are today, and, and hopefully you guys find it interesting. So that's what we're doing new. Um, we may actually have a couple of new podcasts coming on board. Uh, we've had some people that have reached out to us and said, hey, I'd like to do some shows. So you may see some stuff that augments the Cloudcast and the MobileCast and some other stuff as well. So uh, some cool stuff coming if we can find the time and uh, we can sign up some people to do the work. But it uh, should be fun. should be fun. So um, with that, um, you know, as we talk about people transitioning and technologies transitioning, uh, why don't we introduce our guest, um, very cool to have on uh, Kenny Coleman, who I know, longtime friend of the show. Uh, don't know if you're a fan of the show, but longtime friend of the show, um, you know, longtime sort of colleague of both Aaron and I's, and somebody who, you know, has actively been trying to, to transform himself, if you will, and, and trying to learn this new world. So, Kenny, welcome to the show, man. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, it's a longtime listener, first time caller, so glad to be here. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So I, before we before we jump into any of that sort of stuff, um, you know, you just kind of I don't know if it's out of the blue, but you you kind of started. Uh, I mean, you've always run a pretty active blog. You've been out in the public into stuff you're working on in your day job, but you've been you know working on some some development stuff outside of that. Like what what motivated you to start sort of writing code and dabbling in learning languages and all that kind of stuff? Because you your day job pays you to be kind of an infrastructure guy, right? Yeah, it's that's very true, you know. And uh, I'm glad to be the guinea pig on this this new kind of podcast, and it might have to be called the platform cast at, at some point. But you know, really, I, I think that this 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 idea of, of what I you know really started transitioning or trying to really reinvent myself was because there was a, a project that we did internally, and there was a, a person on my team that uh, began to code, and he created this new project, and I was like, wow, that's that's really cool. You know, I should probably start hunkering down and doing it because. The last coding I ever did was in Visual Basic, and doing that within Excel, uh, you know, probably 
close to seven, eight years ago. And so I really thought, well, I'm really never going to get into it. Uh, Power CLI just didn't really mean much to me just because you couldn't really do anything with it. And now I, I, I start looking at what you can do with new um, languages such as such as Rails and Python to Django. And when you see this, um, you know, two things really came to my mind. Uh, first is that for profit, because if you think that if you're ever going to have that million dollar idea, the, the odds of you being able to ever execute on it uh, are going to be nothing if you don't really know how to create a prototype or know how to build something. So that's really where I, I, I started really dabbling to try to figure out, you know, if I have an idea, how can I execute on something? And second, uh, you know, we kind of talked about the transitions, what's happening. Um, you know, when you look at Twitter and you see what other people are doing, you see everything reading about DevOps and everything else. People are talking about infrastructure as code now. And if you know how to code, you can talk to developers, you can uh, relay this kind of information, you can do it yourself. Uh, it's only going to open more doors for you in the future. So that's really why I started transitioning and trying to figure out exactly how I can really start broadening my, my depth of skills outside of just infrastructure or SDN or just cloudy type stuff. Very cool. Okay, so the number one question everyone wants to know, wants to know then is, is what kind of beard are you going to grow and how long are you going to let it get? <laughs> See, that's that's the problem. I mean, I got I've got like uh, uh, a really it looks like I almost never matured for some point. It really grows in patchy a lot. So it's uh, I can I can create a decent stubble, but uh, anything beyond a quarter inch is, is my wife's yelling at me to go to the bathroom and shave. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's 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 problem number one. You're going to have to overcome is uh, just like just like internal politics. You're going to have to overcome beard politics. Yeah, you're, you're never taken seriously then. So you were out in San Francisco uh, last week uh, out at uh, Cloud Foundry Summit. You wrote up a, a real good kind of perspective on not only you know your take on it, having been at events like VMworld and other you know big industry vendor events, but you know kind of what's going on. So why were you out at Cloud Foundry Summit? Uh, what was the, yes. what was the driving force? It was it was really something where uh, you know I got an email from my manager telling me you know he's got me signed up for VM World and EMC World and Cisco Live and you know something came across where I've been really trying to reshift and refocus what I'm looking at and so I I get online and I do searches for all these different kinds of conferences that are that are out there and you know and I I saw the Cloud Foundry Summit and I said you know what this will probably be good um, because uh, you know I read a lot about Pivotal especially in my day job. So let's go ahead and try to figure out exactly what all this is about. So even uh, a week before I, I went, I loaded up Cloud Foundry, uh, just the open source version on my home lab, and it got me an opportunity to start playing with it. But while I was out there, I was introduced to a whole new world of, of new people, the, the pioneers of, of everything, and really what is going to be Cloud Foundry uh, for the enterprise here in the next few years. And the way that everybody kind of looked at this is that this is the second uh, pretty much they had the platform summit and then they had the cloud foundry summit. So this is just the second time that this has gone. Uh, there was about 800, a thousand people there and they, they are estimating in about two to three years that this conference will probably have closer to 8,000 people as platform as a service really starts becoming uh, more adoption with inside of the enterprise. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I could see that Aaron and I were out at AWS this last year. It was you know, 2,500 people. We were at OpenStack Summit. It was like 4,500 people. So these these things that were a few hundred people a couple of years ago are growing pretty darn fast. So um, very cool. Now, yeah, and go oh, ahead. sorry, go ahead. No, go, no, ahead. go ahead. Well, I was going to say one one of the big things, and you had mentioned earlier, like that whole infrastructure is code, and you, you hear all the time like software is eating the world, right? And that's uh, easy to say for like a lot of the startups that we we talk to, but. For those of us that also kind of have one foot in the very traditional industries, um, do you s actually see that coming to be anytime soon? And, and and what kind of examples are you seeing? I mean, you're right. There's there's you're never going to get a away from legacy. It's it's always going to be there. It, if not, then whatever is going to be the future tomorrow, that's going to be the legacy of the the tomorrow times two, right? So there's really no way to ever get away from legacy. I think that's still going to be there. Uh, you know, the big monolithic databases. Uh, you know, any types of uh, internal messaging or anything like that. I think that's still going to be there. Uh, I just think that. The, the enterprises today are also looking at, at a way to start catering to developers. And so in my day-to-day -day business, it's all about talking about infrastructure as a service, um, you know, pulling up virtual machines, show me OpenStack, show me vCloud Automation Center, show me UCS Director. But I think at the end of the day, 
they're really getting confused about what the differences of what developers really need. Uh, do they really need an operating system to be able to take care of? Or if we can use something like platform as a service, it might completely change the way that they are developing, the way that they can quickly push code, uh, as well as relieving internal IT from actually having to take care of all those different virtual machines that are spinning up, as well as actually being able to cram more applications uh, into a platform instead of just sitting there spinning up virtual machines. But like I said, I, I think it's going to be, it's, it's always going to be a transition. Um, there's one of the things that Andrew Clay Schaefer said at the very end, uh, and it's really a, a transition for any company that's out there. If you think about what Nest did to Honeywell and all these other different kinds of uh, businesses that at the end of the day, if you aren't creating a software company, then someone else is, and you're going to lose. So that's why industries are, are constantly shifting, and more things are just turning to software. And so that's why I think that this shift to third platform is really going to start making a, a huge move in the near term for uh, a lot of these these enterprises. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it, it's always interesting. I watched the last couple of of Cloud Foundry events, and I look at this one, and I mean, you had. Monsanto, who was talking about, uh, you know, crop science and you had, uh, you know, automotive companies and you had, uh, you know, insurance companies and like, it, you know, it's not all Silicon Valley based stuff, which is, I think, one of the most interesting and probably one of the most important things in terms of like, will the thing survive? Will it not just be kind of a valley level niche thing, um, you know, which is kind of where we were 10, 12, 15 years ago, we were first rolling out, how do you do intranets and websites and stuff like that? It wasn't just a web thing. So now when you were out there, so obviously Cloud Foundry Summit, you know, has a, a pivotal flavor to it because Pivotal is obviously involved with it, but they don't, you know, Cloud Foundry Summit is more about the sort of open source Cloud Foundry. What'd you hear from other companies that were, you know, building on top of Cloud Foundry, using Cloud Foundry, whether those were providers or companies, you know, that were you know, trying to add value on top of Cloud Foundry. What were you hearing their take on the foundation, on the code, and all that sort of collaboration? Yeah, I think it was it was pretty easy to determine that Pivotal was the the driving force behind a lot of this. Uh, is you could also tell that from a lot of the customer success stories that came up there, uh, pretty much all of them were were Pivotal customers. But it's also something that Pivotal was really on the the bleeding edge for this as well. And I think this is where HP and IBM. And Active State really came in, and they kind of saw that there's there's this this is going to be a market one day, and so they've started creating products, um, IBM and HP. Um, so you have IBM's BlueMix and HP Helion. Uh, those are currently in beta states right now, where you can actually go through and essentially just you know CF push to set your target to the uh, IBM or HP um, uh, APIs, and then be able to push your 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 applications there. Um, and the only really differences around these are the different kinds of microservices that, that each ones are, are making available. So whether they're different kinds of databases based off of Redis or Postgres or NoSQL um, or there are other kinds of services for email distributions, anything like that, these are the kind of things that they're going to try to start differentiating themselves. And it's all going to be about the services as well as speed. Yeah. Now, I mean, did you kind of following up on that, did you hear people that were that were leveraging multiple multiple instances and pushing things from, you know, private environment out to one of the providers or moving them around much? Or is that still kind of theory in terms of interoperability? I, I still think it's it's theory. Um, there was a lot of talk about, yes, you can do this, right? Because since Cloud Foundry is all built on this, this open thought process that if you want to, you can scale applications through um, through Pivotal, through IBM, through your own internal um, uh, say Pivotal CF instance, as well as if you want to run Cloud Foundry on top of AWS and then provision applications out there. So in theory, um, it could possibly work, but you know, for the most part, all the customer stories that came up there, a lot of more talking about running on their, their own internal infrastructure or just running them straight from uh, run, you know, run Pivotal's console. Gotcha, gotcha. Cool. cool. So, so you've always kind of had side projects going, and in this latest kind of pivot, if you will, um, how did you get started in all of this? And, and why did you choose this out of everything that's out there? What, what made you gravitate towards this in particular? Yeah, so what, when I started coding with Rails, you know, you, you start reading these things about Heroku. I had no idea what it was. And, you know, that's when I really had my first taste of platform as a service and really how easy it was to 
actually push an application out. And I didn't really need to provision a virtual machine. I didn't need an Ubuntu instance. I didn't need to worry about uh, loading on Rails and RVM and all, all the other dependencies that would have to go to setting up uh, a web server, whether it's using Nginx or Thin or uh, Unicorn or all these other different uh, web servers that are, that are available to me. All I had to do is it was a single line of code, and I push it out, and there it is. My application's on the web. I, I get I get an IP address or I get a domain name, and I can access it. Uh, blew my mind. And when I was able to realize that, you start figuring out, well, what else is there out there? Um, because Heroku really isn't looked at for really an enterprisey kind of setup just because essentially your code's out there on the web, right? You, you Sometimes you want to have this stuff in-house. So that's where I really started looking into Cloud Foundry. Now, when I compare Cloud Foundry to Heroku, you know, Heroku is probably a little bit farther ahead in, in terms of uh, development ease of use as well as the amount of uh, resources that are available for support aspect. But the cool thing about Cloud Foundry is that um, some of the things inside of there are actually built off Heroku open source projects. So you can really leverage a lot of that a lot of the support documentation for making sure your Cloud Foundry instance is going to be set up as well. But that's really how I got into it is just trying to figure out exactly how I can um, you know, bring this to my everyday knowledge and help customers start really looking towards this way as well. No, that, I mean, that, that's, that's sort of interesting because I know when I've been trying to get back into it and dabbling with it, I mean, the, the, the number of hours I've spent just jerking around with getting Linux set up and, and screwing around with you know, the equivalent of registry stuff, we're trying to get a, a build environment set up. It's just a complete pain in the butt. And it's, you know, 15 different sites on the web and trying to figure out what an error message means. And so if PaaS is sort of getting you to that point where it is literally like focus on the language, focus on the framework, push code, you know, that that's powerful. <laughs> that's powerful stuff, especially if you don't want to deal with IDEs and you don't want to deal with the difference between your local machine and remote Linux host and all this other kind of crap like that. So that's, that's powerful stuff. Now, do you, do you see yourself continue to do that? Or do you, do you find that the more you're building stuff, the more you get comfortable with it and you're like, ah, maybe I want visibility. I don't like what the pass gives to me. Or are you kind of saying, you know what, I'm going to let the pass platform do that. I'm going to keep focusing on, on getting better at coding the applications. Yeah, that's that's the latter is really what I'm looking at because for the applications that I'm writing, PaaS is good enough. I don't need to sit there and uh, create these huge monolithic VMs that have loads and loads of RAM or need to worry about anything like that, right? And the whole point of doing PaaS is scale out, right? Pretty much create as many instances as you need uh, and and use it for that po- that purpose. So I'd, I'd much rather focus myself on on getting better at code than essentially trying to figure out how I can write better scripts to be able to configure VMs, right? That's, that's the whole point of, of, of going to the PaaS route. Yep. If, yeah. if you're going to fail, you want to fail fast. <laughs> yes, very true. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, you know, I suspect if, if we're kind of pivoting the show, you know, some of our listeners will keep listening. Some of them will, will blow us off and, and won't care. For, for those that do, that, that do find this stuff sort of interesting or they're trying to figure out, like, what did you, what'd you learn from the summit that, you know, you're going to sort of take with you in terms of, you know, a lot of times you'll go to an event and, and every once in a while you'll go, damn, that, that makes a lot of sense. I got to, I got to go in a different direction. Like, what are you going to take away from this next couple of years, change your job, change your, in, you know, change your outlook on, on, you know, where you're going. Cause obviously you're a young guy, you get a lot of years to work unless you win the lottery or, you know, uh, you know, marry into a, a bourbon, uh, <laughs> family or something. So what's what's the big takeaways for it, especially as you look at it from a career perspective, not just an industry perspective? Yeah. I, I mean, if I could bank on the lottery, I totally would, right? I think I think anybody wouldn't be out of their mind to do that. But it was definitely that that damn moment. It, it really was when you're when you when you see it actually happen and you're pushing your own code to, to make it happen, you realize that infrastructure as a service really means nothing uh, in terms of what platform is capable of doing. Because we talk about being able to provision virtual machines, whether it's through the cloud automation center, whether it's through OpenStack, um, it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, it's an operating system you have to take care of and and, and, you know, and, and caress and take care of. And you don't really want to do that. Um, at the end of the day, you just want to push your application and, and worry about the code. And I had that, that epiphany moment when you're sitting here at a conference where it's half operations people and half developers. And so people are really coming together and trying to figure out exactly what's going to be best for the greater good here. 
Um, it's not just about the developers and a place for them to have this great big old sandbox. And it's not about the operations people just trying to figure out how we can say no because it, it doesn't fall in with our traditional ways of doing things. Uh, but instead, we've got to figure out a way that um, everybody can work better together as well as ship code fast and ship code often. Um, that's that's really the, the, the thing I came away with. And that this shift of third platform is that it's going to completely change um, the industry in regards to how enterprises really need to think about what they're building as a product. And their software developers are going to need that capability to be able to provision these things uh, and be able to not be hindered by year-long wait times or anything else that it would take to be able to bring infrastructure online. Now, let me ask you this. Um, so you have a fresh set of eyes, if you will, coming into this. Um, so there's almost two, you know, just like there is public cloud, private cloud, there's almost like two versions of PaaS right now, public public PaaS, if you will, or PaaS services, mm-hmm. and, and then and then private PaaS services, which is honestly at the end of the day is just – loading it on top of the same infrastructure like we've always done. It's just, you know, presenting resources in a different way. Do you actually see like enterprises embracing, say, public PaaS services, or do you think they're just going to, you know, make the the internal PaaS products easier to consume going forward? So one of the things that you kind of think about with the public PaaS products is that you don't really know really what's happening behind the scenes for the most part, right? Um, it's really hard to kind of understand what sort of multi-tenant um, boundaries are really set up. Um, it's, it's really hard to kind of figure that out, and nobody really has a great answer because, honestly, that, that answer doesn't exist. When you think about these microservices, they need to be available to every application. So where is the fencing? Where is everything coming in? It, it truly breaks a, a traditional thought process of, well, here's my application. It needs its own web server, database, application server. I'm going to wrap it up into this tightly little coupled package on its own network so nobody else can touch it. Uh, that's typically not really going to work in a, in a kind of PaaS and a kind of PaaS atmosphere, right? So in, in, a, in a public instance, that's really going to be kind of hard to, to sell, uh, especially to some kind of enterprises. But it's also a way that people can maybe start getting used to it, test the waters, and then they can bring it in internally. It's kind of the same thing that, that we saw with, with what AWS has been able to do, right? People can go out there, they can provision stuff, and they like it, right? Then They want more of it. It's, it's, the, it's the cocaine and the infrastructure as a service world. So they, they just keep on buying, buying, and buying more stuff. Um, maybe Pivotal or anybody else that's running a, a, a Cloud Foundry public service PaaS, that's maybe that, that's their, their route instead of having to deal all internally. Um, so there's, there's definitely some different things that, that you could see of, of how this is possibly going to play out. Yeah, and I think that's I think that's kind of the play that guys like Pivotal are sort of hoping for is that, you know, th- there's going to be a market for private or I'm sorry, there's going to be a market for public, but you know, there there is there is a certain amount of inertia and a certain amount of, you know, I like I like my stuff that uh, that people will pay for and you know, feel like they have to integrate it into whatever they have going on in their business cuz change is hard. So yeah, you never want to make your IT teams feel like they're uh, they're no longer useful. So I think also bringing it in house is is never a bad thing too. Yeah, so that'll be an interesting thing. Well, listen, man, um, thank you for. I think we're going to kind of wrap it up because I know uh, you've got a little you've got a little baby who uh, your wife uh, probably wants you to help uh, get to bed if she's not already to bed, <laughs> and uh, we've got we've got stuff to do. But uh, thank you for being on sort of the first uh, I guess pivot pivot show for us in terms of transitioning to new stuff where can um if people want to go find out about some of your side projects or stuff you're doing what's what's the best place to kind of track you down on the internet yeah so the the home page is kendrickcoleman.com i've got pretty much all my blog posts on there as well as some coding projects and uh feel free to, to ping me through there i'd be more than happy to help anyone out especially in this this new road of trying to figure out where this where this journey is going to take us as i said I'm a, I'm a young guy and i'm still trying to figure it all out for myself very cool. Very cool. And if you need a bourbon recommendation, Kenny's uh, right in the heart of bourbon country and uh, knows his stuff as well as anybody. So uh, ping him for that as well. <laughs> or if you've got <laughs> if you've got extra bottles of Pappy laying around, you'd like to send him along. He'll, uh, he'll offer tips for will 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 offer tips for bourbon, as they say. Yes. So cool. Well, listen, uh, Aaron, you want to take the show home? Yeah, absolutely. If you like the show, please tell a friend or leave us a review on iTunes. You can follow us on Twitter at the Cloudcast Net, 
or on the web at thecloudcast.net where you can find links to everything Cloudcast. Thanks, Kenny, and thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good night.